York Alumni Association. I thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Robert DeBrower. I'm the president of the Alumni Association uh, Board of Directors. And um, I'm a partner at the law firm of Prior Cashman, uh, as I was explaining to Amanda, who I would like to introduce as well and congratulate, Amanda Gowan, who is a 40 under, under 40 awardee last week. So all right, congrats. Just come back to spend time with us here. Uh, I'm an attorney as well, but my work is not as important as the work we're going to be discussing tonight. I do intellectual property, entertainment, and media law, uh, which, you know, of course, it's a slightly hyperbolic statement. It is important, but it's not uh, getting to the crux of, you know, humanity and, and, and the sort of impact that it would have on someone's life to be, you know, wrongfully convicted. And uh, I think it's obviously very, very important what you all are doing and uh, the, the consequences of being mentally convicted are just sort of unimaginable um, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's great to see the alumni community here getting together. Um, tonight we have uh, a talk where a fellow alum, Dan Slepian, who is the class of 92, He's an award-winning investigative journalist at NBC News. Um, and primarily known for his in-depth reporting on the criminal justice system. Uh, he's been referred to as a TV news gumshoe by the New York Times. And uh, his reporting has helped exonerate several wrongfully convicted inmates. Joining Dan this evening, we have a Stony Brook University favorite, uh, former professor Nancy Franklin. Nancy was with Stony Brook's Department of Psychology, specializing in human memory. She frequently serves in cases around the U.S. as an eyewitness identification and memory expert, helping to educate judges and jurors on the pitfalls of stranger ID, particularly under the conditions of typical crimes in their investigations. She's been involved in dozens of cases where convictions have been disputed and overturned, sometimes after an innocent person has spent decades in prison. So thank you. Mm. And uh, joining us this evening as a, a late addition, um, we have the, the honor best news, of, the best <laughs> news. of uh, Jeff Deskovic. So uh, with that, I'm pleased to be here. Before, yeah. Start. Yes, please introduce Jeff. I didn't have the opportunity. No, no. Yeah, no. We, we completely blindsided you, but mm -hmm. um, but you're right. He's so Jeff Jeff spent 18 years. Sixteen. Why don't you tell your story? <laughs> <laughs> Jeff can speak. Oh. <laughs> no, I I spent uh, years. I spent 16 years uh, in prison uh, in in New York. I was um, 16 when I caught my case. I turned 17 by the time the trial rolls around. Uh, I was uh, arrested for uh, murder and rape in Westchester County, which I did not commit. Um, I was ultimately wrongfully convicted um, despite a pretrial negative DNA test result. Um, my conviction was caused by a coerced false confession, prosecutorial misconduct, fraud by the medical examiner, a uh, terrible public defender. Um, I was given a 15 to life sentence. Uh, I lost seven appeals. I ultimately did 16 years in prison before further DNA testing through the DNA data bank, not only reaffirmed my innocence, but also uh, identified uh, the actual criminal who was subsequently um, arrested and, and uh, convicted. Uh, he had killed the second victim three and a half years later. Um, just super quickly, I want to get to the, the panel, but I just want to share that I've been uh, home for 13 years. And I got a scholarship from Mercy College, so I finished the bachelor's thanks to that. and I have a master's degree, my thesis is on wrongful conviction cause and reform. Uh, I just graduated law school, I passed the bar. All right. <laughs> I have a nonprofit organization, uh, the Jeffrey Deskovic Foundation for Justice, and um, we've been able to get seven people home that were in the same position um, that I was, and we've been able to pass uh, six laws here in New York in the so I, I asked Jeff to join us because he's way more interesting to hear from than uh, certainly me. Um, I don't know about Nancy. Oh yeah. Um, and and having.
having lived through what Jeff lived through and doing now what he's doing. Um, he is, I was telling him before, I've known a, a lo lot of people in this community, and Jeffrey is exuding authenticity and love and uh, motivation and is a real hero to many, many, many people. Yes. And, and so um, you, you really, we were saying before that you know people were wrongfully convicted, whether you're wrongfully convicted or not, you're in prison, you could get out and, and go down real quick, real easily because of the situation you've been in, or you can fight and be a productive member of society that gives back, and you've done that over and over and over again. Um, so I, I just feel like what we should do is, uh, I, we're just gonna have a conversation. It's a pretty intimate group here, and most of you um, know one of us, or both of us, or all three of us, or whatever, and so, Oftentimes we all speak about this sort of thing, but I think what would be nice after we just, you know, start with our little introductions about how we got into this, um, <laughs> is have a conversation, you know, about uh, the way that this community, the way that this um, issue starts to develop and people start to become more educated and change starts to happen, is groups like this that we have intimate conversations and then you can go back and we can maybe come up with some ideas and start spreading those ideas and talking about it more. So that's that's my plan. So why don't you, do you want to just start about like how you got all into this and what you do? Sure. So I, um, <clears throat> I'm a cognitive scientist. And uh, as you know, my field is memory and memory error. And I, you know, I, I started as a faculty member in 89 um, with no intention of leaving the lab or the lecture hall um, until about 20 years in. Um, I got a call from an attorney asking if I would uh, uh, be, serve as an expert in a, an identification case. There had just been the LeGrand appellate decision um, that now uh, introduced circumstances where judges would need to allow uh, expert testimony for eyewitness cases. And so I agreed and, um, and found out later that the uh, case concerned a murder that had happened outside my bedroom window 16 years earlier. Um, amazing coincidence. Um, and, and I just kept uh, accepting cases and then getting involved in post-conviction cases. And, um, you know, doing the two full-time-ish jobs of being a faculty member and, um, and trying to assist the system got to be a little overwhelming. And so I volunteer, I, uh, I, I volunteer my time now as much as I can to try to, um, to serve the system, to, to help make particularly eyewitness evidence more um, reliable, more diagnostic. And I've stepped away from the university job to do that. Uh, very quickly for, uh, I was just telling a story to somebody about how I how I got into this originally. Um, about 20 years ago, after 9/11, I set out to do a documentary <coughs> on the NYPD about the men and women of the NYPD, and I got access to the Bronx Homicide Task Force. The NYPD allowed me to follow the detective. They assigned me a, a detective by the name of Bobby Delorado, who is a first-grade homicide detective, one of the top of the top in the city of New York. Knowing that, uh, I, I, should, I should say I work, I work at Dateline, I think I said that. Uh, I work at Dateline, I was doing it, it's my 24th year at NBC, and I was doing this as a Dateline hour. So um, I was wiring up the detective and following him on regular homicide investigations. Nothing about wrongful convictions was anywhere close to my mind. And I saw some pretty bad stuff. You know, we went on 20 or 30 murders, and a couple weeks into it, I said to him, you know, you must bring this job home with you, this case. I mean, this job that you bring home, you know, what stuff you see. He says, you know, I really don't. You know, he said, this one case has been bothering me for a decade. I said, what's that? So Bobby started telling me this story about a really bad gang he took down in the South Bronx called the CNC Gang. They made, you know, 12 arrests, 50 murders. You know, the murder rate plunged in the baddest station in the nation, Fort Apache, the Bronx, by 50% that year. Right. And as part of that RICO case, it was a federal case, two of the gang members confessed to him, we did this, we did that, 
We shot this bouncer at the Palladium nightclub on Thanksgiving night, 1990. Bobby's a Bronx detective, he'd never heard of it before. So he goes to the Manhattan DA's office back in 92, and he says, I got these two guys, they're credible, they're, they're confessing to this murder. And the DA said, you know, they're off the money, we just made a conviction, we just had a conviction a few months ago, we got these two other guys. Bobby kind of forgot about it and went on. And then, just before I showed up, someone had contacted him saying, I know those guys are innocent. And it was bothering him, so I said, let's follow that. So I'm holding a camera. This was, by the way, all on television. You, 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 it's out there. It's nominated for an Emmy. It was, it was uh, everything I'm saying is actually true. And when I say it, I can't believe it's true to this day. I'm holding the camera and I'm following him on his reinvestigation as he speaks to the witnesses, as he goes about investigating it. And he finds information in front of my camera that proves that what he's saying is true and that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office had information that they had not turned over like a 911 call 30 seconds after the crime that said Joey and Spanky from 550 East 139th Street committed the murder, the guys who he thought did it. Wow. So he goes to his bosses at the NYPD and he says, what's my obligation? I got Dateline following me around. I think these guys are innocent. He was ordered to remain silent. He was kicked off the case. I was kicked out. He quit his job as a detective to talk to me on camera about it. I continued to investigate the case. And one of the things I did is I found the real killer, Spanky. Got him to Rockefeller Center, eventually. He basically confessed on tape. And the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, under then DA Robert Morgenthau, before they had a conviction integrity unit, said, we're gonna look into this. So a guy by the name of Dan Bibb was the ADA assigned to reinvestigate the case. And he did so after we got the killer confessing after Bobby quit his job for two more years. And he comes to the conclusion that these guys are innocent. And he's ordered to protect the convictions. He quits his job to talk to me on camera about it. He ended up on the front page of the New York Times. And uh, there was a paper written at Georgetown Law School called The Conscience of a Prosecutor because he intentionally did the case. Um, and he quit to talk to me on camera about it. Eventually, when we, after we aired, during that process, eventually a judge overturned the conviction. But to this day, not only, and that happened in 2000, we aired in 2007, they got out in 2005. To this day, not only has the Manhattan District Attorney's Office never admitted they were wrong, they retried the innocent guy after he got out. And he was acquitted, and he was awarded some money, and he now lives in Florida. That was my introduction to wrongful convictions which is a lot different of a kind of introduction, I think, than having somebody in prison write to you saying I'm innocent, or a defense attorney coming to you and saying I think my client's innocent. These were people who put people in prison for a living, mm -hmm. telling me that they couldn't get anybody to listen. Mm -hmm. And it disturbed me so badly, I felt, you know, it kept me up at night. I used to visit David, uh, one of the innocent guys, on the anniversary of the murder for which he was wrongfully convicted every year, which was Thanksgiving Day. Um, I saw his mother and what his family went through. And it, it affected me so much that I felt almost as if I would have felt had I been alive in the 1930s and I went to Germany. I would have come back to America. I would have been sitting here and saying, you gotta see what they're doing over there. They're gassing people for no reason. That's my experience on a visceral level, dealing with wrongful convictions. And it's only grown worse since then, not better. Mm -hmm. But that was my introduction, and since then, my game, my life has been like this surreal game of dominoes, where where one innocent person has led me to the next. And so I've done documentaries now on six of them. Um, and and for me, it's like emptying the ocean with a symbol. When you you know think about the scope of this, people say how many people are wrongfully convicted right now, ripped from their parents, ripped from their families, kidnapped by the state sitting in a cell right now as we speak in this room. How many people are lying on their bed and looking at the ceiling? Nobody knows the answer to that. But if you think about it, mathematically, simply mathematically, we are the largest incarcerator in the world by far, by ever in any civilized society in, 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 in human history. 
You have 25 percent of the prisoners. Right. We have, we have five percent of the world's population. We house 25 percent of the world's prison population. We have 2.2 million people in prison in this country. So if you went to the doctor and the doctor said you have a 98 percent chance, let's say, of coming out of surgery, that's that's pretty good. But you know that's not even civil servants working in a bureaucracy. You know, the DMV <laughs> doesn't work 100, but we know that people are wrongfully convicted thanks to the past 30 years in DNA. We know that happens, right? In 30 years, 30 years, I think as of today, there's something like 2,500 people in 30 years, 2,500 people of which this man is one, have been exonerated in 30 years. If the prison population is 98%, they're right 98% of the time, but if it's 2%, that's 40,000 people today. <laughs> If it's 5%, that's 100,000 people today. If it's 10%, right? What's that number? People don't really know. But it's terrifying to think about it. Because even when you have evidence of innocence, you need a bolt of lightning to strike the courthouse door for you to get a second chance in there. And you need a bundle of evidence. And Jeffrey is one of the lucky ones. So that's what got me into this. And it's something I'll never ever turn away from because I know these people and I know their families and I would only hope that if I was in that position someone would pay attention. And so it's my job to not do, to do that to the public as much as I can through television, through writing, but also like this. I will go to the opening of a soda can <laughs> to talk about this issue because people need to know the real life effect. So why don't you talk about the real life effect? To put in some perspective, um, so um, I mean, I mentioned how old I was when I was arrested. I was um, 16, I went to prison, I was 17. So I miss, I didn't graduate high school on time. I didn't go to the prom. I missed births, deaths, weddings, holidays, rites of passage. Uh, finishing my education at a more traditional age, being well into a career, possibly uh, having having a family. Uh, so that's uh, in terms of the external, but there's the psychological aspect to it after uh, all as well, the after effects. So it's common, uh, it's common for people who've been wrongfully imprisoned to have uh, PTSD related ailments like panic attacks, anxiety, altered personality, mood swings. Uh, there's a feeling of processing things at a slower speed than the rest of the population. There's a feeling of having been frozen in time. So to concretize it, uh, I was released when I was 32, and I felt like I was 17, because that was the age that I last was free. Uh, I, for about uh, six years, uh, I went to therapy uh, four hours a week in order to get to the point you know, where I am now. There's the stigmatic aspect of it. Uh, I'm fortunate that for me, there's not a lot of people questioning my innocence because the actual criminal was caught. There was a report issued by the Westchester DA's office on what happened to my case. Um, so there's not a lot of question about my innocence, although I can't say it's non-existent. But for the most part, it, it's not a factor. But what is a factor is the, the stigmatic aspect of you were in prison for 16 years mm -hmm. wrongfully. Yes, but you were there for 16 years. How much of that rubbed off on you? Is it safe to be alone someplace with you? So in terms of personal life, you know, that is, uh, that is, uh, that is a factor. It was very awkward when I would bump into members of my extended family and, uh, old, and as well as uh, people who were once friends with me because um, they either didn't visit at all or almost never. And when you go really long stretches of time, um, the natural evolution and, and growth and development and personality, uh, I, w I knew who they were intellectually from the memories, but I was a different person and so were they, and it was very hard to communicate. So there's that aspect of it. Um, there was the uh, technological aspect to put some color to that, the internet, GPS. Right. Uh, cell phones, these things didn't uh, exist. Um, there was the cultural aspect also, which uh, for a long time when I 
would go shopping, someone would say, would you like this or do you like that? And I would, well, I don't know what I like. Forget what I like, okay? Because if I pick what I like, <laughs> I'm gonna stand out and look like I'm frozen in time from way back then. So just pick out right. what's trendy and you know, that's, I, can, I can fit in and try to have some kind of normalcy. Um, but that, there's just a, so between the cultural and technological and then uh, when I would go to the cities and neighborhoods that I used to know, mm. and there was just enough houses, buildings, and structures resembling the past that I could recognize, <coughs> but then everything else was changed, mm -hmm. and the people didn't live there anymore. So when you, the cumulative effect of all that, I, if you read as a, as a kid a comic book, you know, you know, what if, or the alternative realities, I felt like that's what I was in. It was a world I didn't belong to. <coughs> Jeffrey, why don't we talk about some of the causes of wrongful conviction? Yeah, yeah so um, it, there are certainly cases of, um, of misbehavior, but from the point of view of someone like me who sees the, the criminal justice system as built on humans, warts and all, um, you know, we, we have to rely on things like um, memory um, so so let's start there right if uh, if if I ask you whether you can identify a particular stranger how do you think you do well so just before you answer just in terms of eyewitness identification yeah the, there's studies have been done for by the innocence project after DNA testing proved someone to be factually innocent scientifically they went back to say why those people were wrongfully convicted vast majority Three quarters? Three quarters. Are because of eyewitness misidentification. Right, and when you look at the, the primary contributors to wrongful conviction, it's psychology. Yeah. So three quarters misidentification. 50% of cases had uh, uh, forensic analysis errors, uh, which can be rather surprising, because you know people think of that as sort of the gold standard. Serology, fingerprint analysis, you know, carpet fiber hair bite marks. Um, and a quarter fall into Jeff's category, which is even more baffling, false convictions. How in the world do you get somebody to admit to killing someone or raping someone or you know, some other horrible crime? How, how do you bring someone to the point of them undermining themselves so thoroughly? And it turns out it's very easy. So we can bounce. Um, we can bounce around between these things because there's been a lot of research on all of them. Uh, forensic analysis and eyewitness identification are cognitive psychology issues. And coerced confessions is just basic, straightforward social psychology. Um, and, and particularly when you see people who've done false confession, it, you know, it could happen to any of us, quite frankly, but who's most vulnerable are kids. Um, people who have low IQ, mental illness, addictions, when they get sort of trapped in a room and, and don't see a way out unless they sign a statement saying that they did something. Um, but getting back to the, the three quarters of the cases that involve eyewitness identification, part of the problem with psychology is that people think they know themselves and other people well, and they have huge blind spots for ways that things can go sideways. So with eyewitness identification, people think they're good at it. And they think that if they are sitting in the jury box and they see an eyewitness who's 100% confident and they do that dramatic moment in court of I'll recognize that person anywhere, that's definitely him, um, people have a very strong tendency to buy that. The problem is that First of all, people are terrible at stranger ID, and I'm gonna, let, let's do a demonstration of that first, and then we'll get to. Can I interject one thing before you do that real yeah. quick? There's a really interesting, uh, you may have heard about it. There's a, there's a guy named Ronald Cotton, who was convicted of raping a woman named Jennifer. That was Thompson. Named Thompson, Thompson. And she was face to face with her attacker. No mask. And she picked out Ronald Cotton. Uh, that is my rapist. Mm -hmm. And DNA proved her to be incorrect. Mm -hmm. And they wrote a book together called Picking Cotton. Um, oh. And now they're teaching a course together. Mm -hmm. um, and have a and so when she was presented with the actual That's guy, crazy. Bobby Poole, she was outraged Unreal. that they would, you know, 
uh, doubt her identification. She right. said she never saw that guy before in her life. Um, and we can talk about how that might happen too. But it's just so such an intimate thing. It's so wrong. Yeah. Not intimate. Well, you know, when you look at the, the DNA close. exonerations yeah. that led to this 75% identification cause, DNA, you know, wh which cases are going to have DNA? Right? Yeah. There's a very large proportion of rapes there where people are yeah. looking at someone for an extended period. Yeah. By the way, most 90% of cases, more than 90% of cases, have no DNA. Mm. Mm. Uh, yeah, zero DNA. All right, so you've had no lots of time to look at this face. Do you think you could identify him? Which one? The fourth, the fourth panelist who's been <laughs> <laughs> So this is your attacker, yeah. and what I'm going to do is uh, show you ten yeah. pictures. Yeah. Uh, another photo of this same guy taken the same day may or may not be there. So what I want you to do is either tell me which one it is or tell me who's not there. Uh, oh my God. Yeah, it's suddenly pretty helpful. Oh. Right? And let's make it even more. And by helpful. the way, what you just said, he may or may not be there, is the way that the detectives should be saying that. Mm -hmm. But they don't say that. Mm -hmm. What they say is, which one of these guys is your yeah, guy? Correct. I mean, or they don't all say that. That's what they should be saying. Stop yeah. interrupting right. my. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the professor. Right. So I'm going to make it even easier. I'm going to make it far easier than what any witness experience is. Mm -hmm. And look at what you're doing. You're going back and forth. You're not sure, right? This is what this is what stranger identification. Is. Okay, so I heard three and nine, but everyone's muttering. I said it's the first one. None of them. Seven or eight. Ten. Okay, we got one, three, nine, and ten so far, and none. Four. Let's try eight. Eight. We got a five and an eight, so I think. I think every eight person's been picked. Right? Uh, I'm saying so the right no, answer. I'm no. I'm saying totally yeah, the right answer in these demonstrations is always he's not there. But particularly if the police already have a suspect, let's say it's number nine, and you have a witness so who comes you. in and says nine, and that. that's going to happen by chance three. some of the time. Um, three. Then is someone still saying three? <laughs> no, three. I'm but saying three now. I changed my mind. Oh, he's not there. It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. When you said that, I said three. Oh, you're just, you think I'm lying. I guess I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, the reason for lineups, rather than just showing a picture and asking people right. to, to answer yes or no, is the problem is, so first of all, people are poor at stranger identification. I hope I convinced you. But they have a tendency to choose. Right. And um, you know, the, the purpose of these extra people is to siphon off long guesses. But of course, the guess might still go to the police suspect. And in fact, more than chance it'll go to the police suspect because you know you, you don't typically have a perfect lineup. Typically, the suspect is the best match to the guy. Yeah. yeah so since this is such a common practice, What's the reform that is most talked about today to address this? Many reforms. Okay. Okay, so mm -hmm. instructions that aren't leading, including when you call the person and say, right. you know, we'd like you to come in for an identification procedure. Don't say, we think we got the guy, come on in and let's see if you can identify him. Um, you know, there's lots of, of um, recommendations for <laughs> avoiding bias because people have a tendency to choose anyway. So right. you want to avoid making things worse. You want to have the person who is, who's administering this not know who the suspect is because, you know, even professional poker players know to wear sunglasses. We are a very right. social species, so we telegraph cues and we pick up cues without either of us realizing it. And if I see you looking at my suspect and suddenly I look expectantly at you, it's going to influence right. you potentially. Right. Um, or if I'm sliding pictures at you one by one, and I slide my suspect, and then I sort of sit back a little in the chair. There's so many ways that um, there could be some influence. Or let's say you start to make noises that you're considering number nine, and I help to nudge you a little bit. Or if you start to consider number eight, and I tell you take your time. You know, the, so right, right. having a blind administrator is really important. 
Having fair fillers is really important, again, to make sure that we're siphoning. Um, videotaping the whole thing, because we can't count on anybody's memory, no matter how honest anyone is, of what got said and how people behaved. And uh, so having videotape al allows the finders of fact later on to be able to take a close look at that interaction um, and see whether there might have been some form of steering or um, one more thing to add into this mix is uh, feedback. So you pick my guy, <coughs> it's not okay for me to say, yes, you got the suspect because potentially you're gonna testify, right? It's not that I've collected the data from you or the evidence from you and now we're done. It's that if I give you positive feedback, What's going to happen is likely you're going to be more inclined to pick that same person later. Your confidence is going to shoot way up. And confidence is the most um, weighty factor for jurors when they see a witness saying, that's him. Um, the, your memory of the circumstances of seeing that perpetrator get better. So now you've had a closer, longer look, and it was brighter, you know, and all of those things are gonna impress the judge and the jurors as um, you being a better witness than potentially you actually were. The circumstances may have been poor. Um, and for those of you who have a background in, in law, um, these are the Manson factors. These are the, the factors that a judge uses mm -hmm. to determine how reliable a witness is. You know, when a witness says, I'm incredibly confident and I had a great view, um, the judge is going to be more inclined to allow that witness to testify. Um, yeah, so this is the start. Now, you were terrible at this. Um, do you mind if I just go? Yeah, yeah, I'm fascinated. <laughs> All right. Um, I haven't heard that word in a while. Um, okay, so let's talk about real crimes. Quick often in the dark, um, often witnesses are under the influence of something, often it's a cross-race identification, and this is not a prejudice issue, this is a perceptual expertise issue. Um, uh, perpetrators often wear hats or hoodies that cover the most important part of, of the head for identifying strangers. Um, weapons draw attention, multiple perpetrators divide attention, um, stress, even though it makes you feel like it's seared in, it makes you worse at identification. And for all of these things, it's not just that you're worse at correct identifications. Um, false IDs go up, because remember, people have a tendency to choose. And if they're not choosing the right guy, they're gonna go to whoever is, is the next best guy. And often, the next best guy is the suspect. Right, where they would have otherwise rejected um, the lineup, they're now more inclined with these factors to go ahead and pick. Um, so those are the circumstances at the time of the crime. And what you have then to a, a memory researcher is you've got this big gaping hole um, that sort of demands to be filled. Memory insists on, you know, it, it begs to be changed. We are designed not for a courtroom. We are designed to update memory, to incorporate new information after the fact, and to forget where those additional details came from. So we're inclined, you know, you get exposed to Ron Cotton's face over and over again. That becomes the face that you see hovering over you. And so, you know, now when we start um, the police asking questions and um, you know you starting to undergo identification procedures there's all sorts of after-the-fact um, influences that can steer you systematically toward a police suspect and from my point of view there doesn't need to be any intention no mischief it could be you know the most upstanding professional you know conducting the investigation and the most sincere witness this is um, you know, the flaws of humanity sort of baked into this process that can lead without anyone's intention um, toward, toward wrongful um, prosecution and then wrongful conviction. <coughs> Sir? Okay. Uh, if we're still talking about wrongful conviction clauses, can I oh, add oh, some? Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Uh, sure. So, um, so incentivize witnesses, uh, otherwise known as informants. Uh, that's a major cause of wrongful 15%. conviction. Fifteen percent. Right. And the the reform there is um, that there should be an external evidence corroboration requirement. So, in other words, no one should be convicted based only on informant testimony without there being some piece of external evidence. Uh, bad lawyering is a main a major cause of wrongful mm -hmm. uh, conviction. In terms of reforms for that, uh, I advocate for one statewide system so there could be quality control and oversight. There should be equal uh, financial and manpower resources between the district attorney's office and the public defender's office. Uh, certainly a case limitation. Uh, it's not unusual for one public defender to represent 100 people um, at the same time. Mm -hmm. And there should be equal pay to both mm -hmm. uh, for both so that the best talent doesn't go to one side or into private uh, practice. Uh, prosecutorial misconduct is, is a, a factor that runs through almost all of the wrongful uh, conviction cases in terms of reforms. There's the Commission on Prosecutor Conduct, which um, I helped uh, pass the first one in, in the country. Um, certainly uh, immunity, so prosecutors have um, uh, immunity, so even if, if any misconduct they have, that they engage in, if it happens after arrest, then you could not uh, sue them in court, even if they withheld evidence of innocence, so I think removing that when it's clear <coughs> and intentional. And uh, lastly, I think criminal, criminalizing clear-cut intentional misconduct. Uh, California did that, it's an e-felony, but they're the only state. Uh, another wrongful conviction factor is what's um, called tunnel, uh, tunnel vision, which mm. is uh, really a psychological thing where you form a conclusion and then you work backwards and you mm. ignore evidence to the contrary and only focus in on evidence which confirms uh, the original uh, original uh, thought. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, junk science before, maybe not using the term, but you laid out a lot of them on things that used to be allowed in court as evidence that has like an air of being scientific, although it's not. Uh, things like tire track, uh, footprint, bite marks, uh, and name just, uh, name just a few. There's forensic, forensic fraud. We have a sarcastic term in the field which is called dry labbing which, uh, in other words, they don't need to put the water, remember, in school, microscope, and you put a little, you make a wet mount, and on dry lab, and you can skip the water, we don't need it because we're gonna get right to the conclusion, which is gonna be a prosecution uh, oriented rather than the science just being ground, ground level truth. Um, in terms of uh, false confessions, uh, the, I wanna discuss the reforms around that. Uh, so videotaping interrogations from beginning to end, why don't you explain what happened in your opinion? Sure, okay. Uh, so, uh, I was, um, so I was, so first of all, just background wise, um, I came from a single parent household, so my father was never involved in my life, so that intersected with the good cop, bad cop uh, technique, uh, otherwise called Mutt and Jeff, where one officer takes a more aggressive role, the other pretends to be a, a friend. So I began to look at the officer who was pretending to be my friend, he's like a father figure. Mm -hmm. Before I, um, the career I wanted to have when I grew up, uh, pre-teenage years, was I wanted to be a cop. <laughs> so the police, oh, for about six weeks, they played this game with me in which half the time they would speak to me like I was a suspect, and the other half the time they would um, pretend like they needed my help to solve the crime. So my age, along with that desired career, was how they pulled the wool over my eyes. Uh, eventually, mm -hmm. they got me to agree to take a lie detector test so they drove me on a school day, so my mother and grandmother thought I was in school, uh, so they didn't call around looking for me. They mm -hmm. drove me across the county lines from Peekskill in Westchester County to the town of Brewster, which is in Putnam County, so it was 40 minutes away by car. So I, I didn't know where I was, and it was pretty far, so basically I can't leave on my own. Um, I didn't have any attorney present, and. They didn't give me anything to uh, eat. They uh, gave me a, f a four page brochure on how the lie detector worked and it had a lot of big words in it that I didn't understand, but then I thought I was there to help the police, so what does it matter? Let's just get on with it. Mm. So they put me into a small room. The holographist was actually a Putnam County Sheriff's investigator, but he was dressed as a civilian, so I never knew that he was a police officer. Uh, he attached me to this machine, which 
basically made me uh, immobile. And uh, then he launched his third degree tactic. So he invaded my personal space. He raised his voice at me. He kept asking me the questions, same questions over and over again. Uh, he was kind of a mountain of a man, I, I was 16 and maybe 140 pounds. And he kept that up for six and a half to seven hours. And eventually, um, uh, he told me, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told me through the polygraph test, the lie detector test result that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. So that really shot my fear through the roof. And then the officer who had pretended to be my friend, he came in the room and he told me that the other officers were gonna harm me, but that he'd been holding them off, but that he couldn't do that any longer. Look, you gotta help yourself. Just tell them what they wanna hear. Go home afterwards, you're not gonna be arrested. So being young, naive, frightened, uh, 16, I wasn't thinking about the long term. I was only concerned with my safety in the moment. I was in fear of my life because the fact that I didn't know where I was and no one else knew either, it loomed pretty large. Uh, I felt overwhelmed emotionally and, and psychologically. And then he had thrown me this false life preserver, you know, the, the, mm. the false promise. And so I latched on to that and I made up a story based on the information they gave me that day and in the six week run up to it. By the time it was said and done, I had collapsed uh, into, on the floor into a fetal position. So, <coughs> I want to add that it wasn't videotaped, there wasn't audio, there was no signed confession, it was just the officer's word, and when they came to court, they left the threat and false promise out of their testimony. So, you might wonder whether this is unusual? Um, and as you're telling this story, I hear many sort of standard tactics. So um, what you do is you, you put some, you isolate someone um, and make them feel no control. Um, and there are a couple of very standard um, methods. Uh, so so uh, a very commonly used technique is called the read technique in interrogating suspects. Um, with a few sort of prongs to this. So one is maximization techniques where you terrify the person um, and make them think that if they don't cooperate, you know, they'll go in for life or, you know, whatever the, the horrible thing is that you would hang over their head. Um, there's also minimization techniques. So um, the, the good cop, you know, putting your hand on the person's knee and saying, um, I can see how you might have done this. Maybe she was asking for it, or maybe, you know, depending on the case, maybe your friends were, you know, sort of pressuring you and you went along and, you, you know, this is certainly not how you normally are. Just sort of pave the way to help um, lead them to a confession. Um, making them think that there's no other way out but to cooperate. And, um, and, and the third prong, the false evidence ploy. So it actually is allowed to say you failed the polygraph, even if you passed. <laughs> um, or to say they found the gun, we found the gun, we have your fingerprints, you know, we have you on surveillance video. You know, any sort of um, bluff that, uh, and, and the terrifying thing about this is that yes, if you're guilty, those things can certainly push you toward a confession, but if you're innocent, there's sort of two ways you might get yourself to a confession. One is to think, how in the world do they have me on surveillance video? How in the world did they decide it's my fingerprints? I don't know how I got into this nightmare, but it looks like my best chances are to go ahead and confess and try to get you know, a reduced sentence. This is a nightmare, but it might be, you know, it, it actually is sort of rational to, to look at your situation and decide this is the best path. The other way that you might go is, I know I'm innocent, thank God they found the gun. Thank God there's fingerprints. You know, I can go ahead and sign the confession, get home, right? Which is something that a teenager might have on their minds rather than the long-term consequences. Let me just sign this thing, it'll all work out. Right. You know, we'll all have a, a laugh over a drink later on when they find out the fingerprints belong to someone else. And meanwhile, there may be no gun. There may be no evidence that they can um, later test and find out you're not involved. 
I'm going to add them in because you're talking about the um, coerced compliant variety of yeah. false confession, but there's also the uh, internalized false confession, which is when the uh, suspect momentarily comes to doubt their own uh, own innocence. Mm -hmm. I mean, this stuff is, you know, you look at this this chart, for example, and let's just say this is done by the book. <laughs> Look how hard it is. Just to give you an example of how slippery that slope can get, there's a, there's a it's more than a case to me now, but there's, there's a gentleman by the name of John Adrian Velasquez, who, who uh, Jeffrey knows, and um, I met him as a result when I did the Palladium case, the innocent guy in the Palladium case was in the law library, and John Adrian was in the law library, and they met each other, John Adrian wrote to me, in 2002, I spent 10 years investigating his case. We did a special hour on him in 2012, and as we sit here today, he remains in Sing Sing. I've known him for 17 years. Mm -hmm. But in his case, <coughs> there is only eyewitness identification, that's it. And the key eyewitness, there was, a, there was a murder at an illegal numbers parlor run by a former detective in Harlem, who the number parlor was in the confines of the precinct where that detective once worked. Wow. And it was a robbery. Two men did it. Nine eyewitnesses. Nine. All of them were black. Important when we talk about cross-racial identification, John Adrian happens to be a light-skinned Hispanic man. All of the eyewitnesses said the shooter, within hours of the murder, all of them said the shooter was a light-skinned black man with braids. All of them. Three days after the crime, they were looking for a light-skinned black man with braids. They even had somebody's name, a guy named Mustafa. Searching, they, were pick, they picked up a guy off the street walking his dog. He was a light-skinned black man with braids. <sighs> Three days later, they find one of the nine eyewitnesses. Two of them ran right after the crime. There was a heroin dealer selling heroin to his user in this numbers parlor. Murder happened to this guy, so those eyewitnesses ran. The cops were looking for them too. They find them three days after the murder. Twenty-year-old heroin dealer, black guy, in an Augustus Pram. He says the shooter's a light-skinned black man with braids. Police pick him up, bring him to the precinct in Harlem. He has 10 bags of heroin in his underwear. They put him in front of a computer screen and they start showing him pictures of light-skinned black man with braids and somehow later they show him Hispanic men as well. He looks at 1,800 mugshots. The heroin is on the table in front of him. According to his own account, the police are saying, you better tell us who did this or you're going to be arrested for the murder. He says he picked somebody at random, turned out to be John Adrian. Now, he didn't say random back then. Today, he's saying random. Back then, he picks out John Adrian. He's allowed to leave the precinct with his heroin uncharged. He goes to Pennsylvania and gets in trouble in Scranton. Now, the trial is a year later. John Adrian's arrested after that based on eyewitness identification. Name had never been part of this before. No other evidence. He has an alibi, two alibis. He was in a different borough. He knew nothing about the crime. Never been the place. Didn't know his co-defendant. A year later, trial comes around. Augustus Brown is now in Pennsylvania. He does not want to testify. The Manhattan DA's office gets a material witness order. Two detectives go to Pennsylvania. They pick him up and they put him in handcuffs. And they bring him to the trial. And he sits in the tombs, which means he sits in jail in the courthouse in Lower Manhattan for six days before he testifies. He testifies, the day he testifies, he gets out, they give him money for food, they give him mm -hmm. money for a hotel, and he's free after he says it's JJ. He says to anybody who will listen to him mm -hmm. that he picked JJ out at random, that he was threatened, mm -hmm. that he knows it wasn't him. JJ's still in prison. Wow. But a, so, a jury convicted on that. Right? A jury convicted on him. Right. Saying so what's that's the, the deal? Guy. What's the deal with the jury and the heroin and all the other pieces? It gets complicated mm -hmm. in all of these cases. Right. But by the time that trial happens, the jury never heard that there was another witness. I mean, another suspect. The jury never heard that he was threatened by police because he just wants to get out of there. So he says, "Yeah, I had heroin on me." Yes, I was a drug dealer, but I saw the guy before. I knew it was him, you know, the, and, that's, and, and by that time, they had two other witnesses. They had four witnesses, eyewitnesses, 
They called four eyewitnesses. Right. Augustus Brown and then two brothers who both had records, who mm -hmm. both had deals with the DA's office mm -hmm. to testify mm -hmm. to reduce their sentences. All three said it was him. The fourth eyewitness was an 86-year-old woman who was testifying, and when asked to identify John Adrian in a courtroom, she pointed to juror number six. Mm -hmm. oh, and everybody in the courtroom started to giggle. This guy's on trial for his life, right? But three eyewitnesses, two brothers who had deals, and Augustus Brown, test that's the case. They all testified, and they said that's him. The jury deliberated for four days, Jeez. which is unheard of mm -hmm. in Manhattan. Well, I would say in a case like this, I should say. It was a Friday afternoon, late in the afternoon, and they sent a note to the judge, and they said, we can't decide. And mm -hmm. the judge says, we're going to keep you sequestered over mm -hmm. the weekend. <laughs> They came back and they acquitted him on the top charge and they convicted him on the second charge. Mm -hmm. Two of the jurors have interviewed with us and said as soon as they left that day they knew they made the biggest mistake of their life and one went back to the courthouse to try and mm -hmm. take back her verdict wow. and the judge said it was too late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he had alibi witnesses and he happens to be an incredible human being, am I yeah. right? <clears throat> yeah. So Dan, you actually brought me to my first of two questions which was have you interviewed some jurors who have immediately came out and said, you know, that was not how I felt. But my other same question for Nancy is, you know, what's that psyche with besides saying you can't go home, right? Because that's obvious, right? Yeah. Now there's the pressure on to choose, even though you might be wrong. So there's a psyche in, you know, I think of the movie 12 Angry Men, yes. right? And, you know, convincing someone when they shouldn't be convinced otherwise, if they're not convinced that it's right or wrong, how does that play out? And then you know, when juries then jurors make a decision and shortly after are coming public, Dan, like there should be some sort of protocol for navigating that. And then I think about what Jeffrey was saying, you know, in the trial, you have an attorney, whether they're court appointed or not, and they're going to say misleading, you know, leading the witness. You can't do a leading question, but when they're interrog interrogating you, they can lead you all they want. And is that where we have an opportunity to change legislation that you can't lead in interrogations just like you can't lead in a trial for an open-ended, you know, with an open-ended question rather than a, a, a directed question to help you in making your case? Yeah. There are about Do you, ten, did that all make sense? Questions in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'm certainly happy to, to grab at some of them. So uh, what's being brought up here that that I was latching onto as I was listening to people is this issue of coercion and right. how often it creeps right. up. So we certainly have the, you know, the worst possible kind of coercion sitting next to me, um, being led to falsely confess. There's coercion of witnesses sometimes um, where they feel like they must give whatever response um, that they wind up giving, and I certainly have been involved in a bunch of cases where uh, witnesses have, um, during the the litigation post conviction for uh, you know toward exoneration, where witnesses have um, have given affidavits saying that they were pushed. Um, there's coercion potentially in inside the jury room. There's coercion um, when people are offered plea deals, you know. Um, you may or may not know that almost, you know, every case ends in a plea deal. And it's very similar to this issue of, oh my God, you know, if I don't give my confession, I'm looking at something worse. And if I don't accept this plea offer, I'm looking at something worse. And so you're, you're trying to navigate a gamble. Um, when you come up for parole, um, there could be the coercive circumstance uh, where you're expected to show remorse. And if it's a crime that you didn't commit, that's an issue. Um, mm. I've been involved, right. just, just one quick one to add to this is um, th there's a, a case that I was involved in, um, a, a woman convicted of murder in Little Rock when she was 16. Um, the witnesses all described a 30-year-old woman dressed sort of dumpily with her hair a mess um, and big pock marks on her face and um, the person who wound up being convicted was 16 with her hair done and you know the white dress she'd worn to church an hour before um, with no you know with a, with clear skin 
And um, it just struck me as I reviewed the case that this was outrageous. You know, I come at this as a scientist looking at how can things go wrong and how can I help, but right. there are some cases where it just breaks my heart. And um, it struck me that she had such a strong case toward truly being exonerated and, and found actually innocent. And along the way, she was offered um, a time served deal. Yeah. And of course she took it. I mean, yeah. I couldn't blame her. Um, she'd been in yeah. prison for an awful long time. Um, wow. But the, and, and I, I also oh certainly don't begrudge that as something that people get offered because this process can, can take so many years. Um, and if she accepted, she could get out immediately. Um, but it's inherently a coercive sort of circumstance. It's, it's so hard to sort of take so this deep. out yeah. of the process. You know, you, th you, you talk about um, these plea deals. Jeffrey had a, this guy, Lorenzo Johnson. Yeah. Lorenzo Johnson was wrongfully convicted in Pennsylvania. Spent 18 years? 16, 16, and, 16 and, a half. and a half years. And his conviction was overturned. And he goes home, and he gets his fiance, and he gets a job, and he's a great guy, and he's living life, and the appellate court overturns the vacating of the sentence. Mm -hmm. And guess who drives him back for a life sentence? Jeffrey Deskovich. Mm. Oh my God. Mm. And he remained, to continue on, he, he, he remained in, in, inside for another um, five years. Until so, he took it. Yeah, yeah, so a deal. bunch of evidence was, was uncovered that the uh, only, uh, only person, the uh, sole witness, who, uh, the sole eyewitness was actually an alternative suspect, and that hadn't been turned over. Mm -hmm. The motive witness had a relationship with the lead detective's mother, like a familiar relationship, and there were several hundred pages of uh, discovery material which had been withheld. So finally he gets to an evidentiary hearing where those issues are gonna be li litigated, mm -hmm. and, and he had a great chance to win, but the, the attorney general of PA, you know, made the, this offer, look, you can keep fighting this, but we're gonna, we're gonna drag this out, we're gonna mm. appeal if we lose. You know, you've already lost once, you got convicted, look how long it took to be overturned, then we won again, and we've been beating you since you've been back, mm. so you can keep going with this if you want to. Wow. You can go home tomorrow if you'd like instead. Mm. And that's what he did. And he well, 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 the deal, there's no low contender plays. I mean, you hear these stories one after another, another, and it's one is more egregious, it, on your way home, a uh, shameless plug, you can listen to my podcast called 13 Alibis on Apple uh, Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast. It, crazy story. A guy named Richard Rosario was convicted of a murder in June of 1996 in the Bronx based on stranger eyewitness. He hears police are looking for him. He's in Florida. He takes a bus back to Florida, knocks on the door of the precinct, and he says, I hear you looking for me. You got the wrong guy. I was in Florida for my friend's baby was being born. Here's the names, phone numbers, and addresses, contact information of 13 people that can tell you that I was down there. Including a sheriff's deputy. Including a sheriff's deputy. A well, at the time it was a sheriff's deputy, but now, yeah. Long story short, 20 years go by. No one from the NYPD or the Bronx DA's office ever called those people. I, his, his appeals were denied all the way to the United States Supreme Court. We did this story on him, and he got out the day after we released it. Mm -hmm. He was in jail for 20 years. That's too long. He was in jail for 20 years. Wow. 20 years. And, and there was a miscommunication with the defense attorneys as to why nobody investigated. But, but, but my point in telling you that is that like that's what it's that is. simple. The defense attorneys like, failed. There's cases yeah. that are difficult where people are innocent, and that's... By the way, those are the dangerous ones because right. even for me, like you, you have to look at the blades of grass and the nuances. And he dealt drugs, but he didn't shoot this guy. And you know, there's very few that are the headline cases. Like I have 13 people saying I was in Florida. I wasn't even in the state. I was a thousand miles away. That's kind of mm -hmm. easy for everybody to understand. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it kind of headlines about how egregious it could possibly be. And by the way, just as a note, I know we're here talking about wrongful convictions, but you know, you hear all these horror stories. But the world of wrongful convictions for me has opened the door to the bigger issue of mass incarceration in this country. I just did a special with Lester Holt, 
um, in September called Justice for All. It was a week long special, and I spent he and both of us spent two nights locked in a cell um, in the Louisiana State Penitentiary, right in the same building that houses death row. Mm -hmm. And um, we spent three days, two nights and three days in that prison, speaking with unfettered access, speaking to guys who were locked up. And spoke to a guy who was locked up. In, when he was 17 years old in 1958. 83 years old, he's there for 66 years. He just died two weeks ago, actually. Right. Um, juvenile lifers, locked up at 17, and they're now in their, in their 70s. Um, and, we look, and I also went with the Vera Institute for Justice to tour prisons in Germany and Norway at the end of 2018. And those two experiences, which is a totally different way of, of, of thinking about mass incarceration, and the headline for there is, their focus is human dignity. Mm. Over there, officers their goals call them. the incarcerated people by their names, not by their numbers. A good day over there is to make sure somebody doesn't come back to prison. A good day here right. for an officer is to make sure you go home alive. People who are incarcerated wear their own clothes. Some have keys to their own cells. They have refrigerators in their cells. They're good at school is mandatory. They're given training. Ninety percent of the people that are sentenced there or get a fine. Eighty percent of the people that are sentenced there get a fine, not jail time. Of the twenty percent that are sentenced to jail, ninety percent of those are two years or less. Here, eighty percent of the people who are convicted get jail time. Of those people, ninety percent are five years or more. So we have a completely different thought. And, and the headline, by the way, about all of this is not only what we're doing, depending on what side of the aisle or your personal beliefs is morally the wrong way to treat human beings, which I fall into that camp. But even if you don't believe that, even if that's the end of the sentence about criminal justice reform, by the way, it's the right thing to do. The headline is, is we're paying way more money to make ourselves less safe, because our recidivism rates are higher than the most. Mm -hmm. I want to just add, weigh in a little bit on the mass incarceration yeah. uh, issue. So, um, you know, when I, when I was in prison, I mean, there were uh, there, there, was, there, seemed, there seemed to me to be a lot of people there who didn't need to be there, just just guilt innocence off the table uh, for a second. I mean, there were a lot of um, model prisoners who had committed serious crimes, like a decade or several decades. They were model prisoners already. There didn't seem to me to be any constructive use for their continued uh, incarceration. Often they were denied parole by decisions by the parole board, which references the nature of the crime, which is something that was known before the first day in prison was served. There certainly was the elderly uh, in prison. I mean, the, the prison right. really wasn't equipped to deal with geriatrics. There were a lot of people oh, that, yeah. you know, they had a, were living either in the hospital or certain galleries where just people with really serious medical issues. But you, I saw some of their decisions, and it said if you were released, you would not, you know, remain at liberty without breaking the law. You're released at this time is incompatible with society's welfare. And if it wasn't so serious, it would almost, you know, be, be laughable. Uh, there's still a lot of people uh, incarcerated uh, who were over sentenced. There were people that, when we did the, as a state, when the Rockefeller drug laws were, were, were reformed, you know, where people were getting 20 and 30 year prison sentence for an arbitrary uh, small amount of, of drugs. But even with the reforms that happened, that, that, that wasn't across the board. There still were people, I knew people inside that were sentenced to more time than other prisoners I knew that were there right. for committing acts of violence, including sometimes taking uh, life. And by the way, th there's 2.2 million people actually behind bars. There's 4 million people under court supervision. There's mm -hmm. roughly 7 million people right. together that are under some sort of court supervision or behind bars. And when you think about it, first of all, those people, need the most help. Mm -hmm. They get the least help, because when, when they get out, they can't get food stamps, they can't get school mm -hmm. student loans, they can't get government programs. They're excluded from being, they're second class citizens forever, wow. right? Can't vote in, in many places, right? So that, that, that's the first layer of it. But the second layer of it is, and if you think about it as concentric circles, the center circle are people like Jeff. And, and the other people, well, and, and even guilty people, right? They're, 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 but the, the F is their families and their children and their communities. And, you know, John Adrian, who I just told you about, who's been in prison 17 years, oh, he, his son, I met his son when, his, when he was eight years old. I gave him a camera to start filming himself. I was with his son when he was 16, when he got out of his first halfway house. John Adrian used to write letters to me. I'm so afraid for my son. 
because he doesn't have a male role model at home. His son is now 23 and is, in his, is doing a two to five year sentence for burglary upstate, right? So when you talk about the effect of a wrongful conviction, you know, those are not the only people affected. It's right. families and entire communities that are affected. And, and it, in my view, based on what I've seen, and I'm gonna make, you know, say more than just wrongful convictions, I'm, it's about mass incarceration, particularly, you know, um, <coughs> hundreds of thousands of people are just, it's an epidemic, and it's tearing apart families and communities. I wanna add another aspect of wrongful conviction, you know, it, that it, um, it, we, in a broader sense, it, it uh, is a public safety issue mm -hmm. in the aspect of the actual criminal history to strike against, like in my case, the actual uh, mm -hmm. killer. He, he right. killed the second victim mm -hmm. uh, three years ago. <coughs> Dan, but the gentleman, I think, has yeah, a question. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. almost done, so why don't we just check? I mean, it seems to me, and what, and I actually live to this, but I'm not talking about that now. But that there's, a, there's a serious problem in the, what Jeff is talking about, is there a real serious problem with these prosecutors? Because they're not examining him correctly. They're, they're missing. And they, how, how do you fix that? Because that has got to be fixed. You're talking, mm -hmm. And the defense lawyers, I'm telling you, I had one. I, the guy had to be like on drugs or something. I mean, I don't know what they do. They take money, and like it's like it, it's way, really uh, weird. I mean, it's weird. I did a story uh, years ago in the year 2000 in Texas about a guy named Gary Graham, who was executed, and he was um, clearly, arguably, innocent. I mean, he was a bad guy, but his defense attorney came to court drunk every day and was sleeping, <laughs> sleeping. <laughs> And the appellate court ruled that that was not unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. That he was Texas, sleeping in Texas. Texas. Texas, but there, there, there's a really serious problem because yeah. they're not, they're not on, like, they're not that, like, you know, like, there's a thing like, you know, you're on target, you know, like, like you shoot an arrow, you know, you get bullseye. But the, these people, they, they, they couldn't get anything, you know. Well, they couldn't, yeah, so and they're functioning, and they're, they're functioning in power mm -hmm. positions. And, and the, mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, it seems they really need to be trained. Okay, so I mean, again, I come at this with no finger pointing. I mean, certainly there are cases where you gotta point fingers, but um, you know, let's start with detectives. Let's not put everything on the shoulders of people who then take the case from the detectives. Um, there is a real issue of confirmation bias. Yeah. Um, there's a real uh, problem with, uh, as you brought up before, leading questions. Right, so if, I, if I'm a detective and you uh, witnessed a car accident, I say how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, you're gonna give me a higher estimate because I used the word smashed than if I had asked how fast were they going when they bumped into each other. Um, you can so easily influence the evidence um, simply by asking a question and you have to use words to ask a question and it, you know, it's, it's that subtle of a, of a problem. Um, you can influence the evidence that you create and you can also fail to interpret the evidence appropriately. So for example, um, in, in the case that I mentioned before with the 16 year old who was in her Sunday church dress, that case involved five witnesses not identifying her and the police didn't recognize the value of that as evidence. Um, and, and they used the one witness who had been very clearly led through showing the picture over and over again of the, of the suspect. And of suggesting that, you know, maybe you didn't pick her because you were afraid before. You know, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily interpret these, very, these moments of very poor judgment as intentional steering. But I think when you have people who haven't been trained in, I don't know, I think of it as, as simple scientific methodology, then you run into trouble with, it's a very simple issue of failing to bag the evidence and contaminating it on top of it. It, it seems to me, you know, they've been, when you look at the country, there have been these moments around discrimination like like women race 
age discrimination, uh, disabilities, where states have been left to deal with these issues in cities. And we found that they couldn't deal with them or they right. dealt with them based on the temperature in those states. And this is, seems to me to be an issue that's crying out for national attention so you have uniformity yeah, and training. So and the question is how, though? Well, right. you know, right, right. think about this. Like, I think that when um, Donald Trump signed the First Step Act at the end of 2018, mm -hmm. people who are not really schooled in criminal justice and just starting hearing about criminal justice, oh, that problem solved, right? Mm -hmm. There's 2.2 million people, as we know, in prison. Two million of them, two million of them are in the states, housing state right. prisons. Right. The First Step Act only deals with federal prisons, federal, right? right. 200,000 people. Of those 200,000 people, it's things like you're not going to be shackled when you're pregnant anymore, and you need to live, you know, put people closer to their homes, and you can shave a little time off, you're right? Tiny little baby steps. And so the, I think that people, to galvanize people, like to get, to galvanize people's attention and focus is a really, really hard thing to do. And I think geography plays a huge role in this because the laws of Mississippi are going to be a lot different right. than laws in New York, but, but can, that doesn't can, mean the constitutional can, issues. But are can federal law super? Could there be a movement to supersede state penal codes, or and and or the and or the state? Yeah. In what types of law are you talking about, though? I mean, right. federal like legislation maybe, is maybe not going to be lineups. Yeah, or some, some of these issues, or no, or do you some pretty much have to come up with a state by state program? You have to do state, to come up, and that's massive. You would have to do state. You have to do state by state. Yeah. I think like with training and stuff, you you know, like the, the feds could take the lead, and then other states will follow on a lot of things. Like yeah, th there's that. But the other thing too, I mean, sometimes when they do pass federal legislation, there's the carrot in there. If they're going to get yeah, that, if the states adopt it, then they'll be yeah. eligible for certain funding, and if they don't, they're not. Right. right but yeah, but right. then again, you can't do that with every piece of legislation either, you know. And and you know, and all these deficiencies that we're talking about that cause wrongful conviction, we're, we're talking about the state system. These deficiencies all exist in the federal system also, though. But unlike. On the state level, where there's a lot of advocacy work around trying to pass, you know, legislation to address these deficiencies, that's going on in the states. But for the most part, that's not going on on the on the federal level, at least in terms of wrongful conviction. Ma mass incarceration is a different is a different. But even as as you know, Dan pointed out, that's only as the federal prisoners. But then into some. Um, so, okay, so so you know, um, this is very good, very very informative, and also scary. But you know, I'm wondering, you know, I mean, how widespread is it? Is there a pattern? I mean, like, you know, I mean, who are people that are affected? Like, you know, I, I know um, Jeffrey very well. I mean, is he an example of the people that are affected by it? Or did yeah, I, I always, people ask me that all the time, and I just feel like there's such a um, widespread definition of what it means to be wrongful convict, mm -hmm. wrongfully convicted. There's people like Jeffrey mm -hmm. that are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I never heard about. I wasn't there, mm -hmm. right? But then there's other people that's like, no, there's close. a case. There's a case named uh, Ryan Holly, right? In no, in Florida, mm -hmm. he's convicted of felony murder, okay. meaning he didn't actually pull the trigger, but they found him liable because. Of, so what he was he was home at a party. He had a party at his house, mm -hmm. and he was drunk. And two guys he didn't know said, "Hey, let me borrow your car keys. We're gonna go rob Jennifer's house." Mm -hmm. And he was half drunk. He gave him the car keys. They drove ten miles away. They robbed Jennifer. Mm -hmm. They ended up killing her. What? Ryan was charged with felony murder and got 25 to life for giving him the car keys, right? Yeah. So he's, 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 he is a violent murderer in the eyes of, right? right. Is he wrongfully convicted? Did, so, so people who, who are right, plead right. guilty to crimes that they didn't commit mm -hmm. just to get a lesser mm -hmm. sentence, right? Mm -hmm. um, my take, and you guys can answer that on your own, from what I've seen, is like shooting fish in a barrel. It's as it is terrifyingly widespread, mm. terrifyingly. Well, well, you know, you know, I think about uh, you know uh, Central Park Five. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, that really brings us home. Like, you know, those were, you know, I mean, the, the way the cops, you know, really forced yeah, those right. kids to right. confess, and you know, I mean, that's like, you know, I mean, I mean, that's really. And that scary. was here in Manhattan. Exactly. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and part of it is the psychology. I mean, it's just. 
psychology scans, but the socio psychology, the psychol psychology, psychology of this. What's the like word? Say <laughs> it is like it, 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 there, there's such a heavy component to that, and so many nuanced layers where those cops. I don't know those cops. I'm not going to speak to them. But you would think, okay, they've been in the job for 20 years. They're, they're the seeing job. all these young black men right. constantly breaking the law. Constantly, get, those guys are probably guilty of something anyway, right? right? Well, so let me let me throw in on this. So first of all. Um, I want to I want to actually say something kind about mm -hmm. Elizabeth Lederer, uh, who prosecuted that case. She actually noticed the discrepancies between the confessions mm -hmm. and tried to clear that up with the the um, the boys. Mm -hmm. She did some due diligence there, and I'm I'm I actually appreciate that. Um, but I want to actually go back to this question of who's most at risk, because right. boy is there an answer to that. So let's talk about false confession mm -hmm. kids. And by the way, that read technique that I talked about before that's so effective in getting people to give confessions whether they're guilty or not, that actually is being marketed to high school administrators now, which frightens the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. um, but kids who are compliant and don't have resources um, who are much more short-term oriented, they're at great risk. Um, I, I mentioned mentally ill people, people of low intelligence. Um, there's also addicts mm -hmm. who are isolated for potentially hours on end as they go through withdrawal. I mean, there's certainly more vulner vulnerable populations mm -hmm. for killer's confessions. In terms of um, being falsely identified, mm -hmm. I worry about, you know, people who have their mugshots in the system for stupid stuff, right. you know, small drug Making charges, and, and they are now going to show up potentially in a murder photo array, mm -hmm. and they could very easily be selected. And then I worry about people who um, can't, you know, thankfully in New York things have changed, but around the country people who can't make bail and can't participate in formulating their own, you know, their defense, uh, you know, people who are at all sorts of disadvantages. And we know the, the categories of people who are just um, disadvantaged across the board, they certainly are here as well, including having a lot of prejudice against them among uh, jurors. Well, let me just can, say I ju that. can I say something? Just about um, the videotaping of, mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, uh, I know Jeffrey for a long time, and I know Doreen and, and Frank, and for 12 years I've been a government whistleblower. I was a contractor for the city and the state, and uncovered horrific procurement fraud and um, blew the whistle. And, you know, I haven't been in a jail cell wrongly convicted, but I have been attacked, defamed by government officials with abuse of power. And I finally, um, and it was 2011, I've been going through this for a very long time, and I um, got recommended to go and speak with uh, the chief of labor and rackets uh, for a district attorney. And he took me after a three hour meeting outside and he said, go to Radio Shack, don't go home, buy a tape recorder, go online, go to a spy store, buy a pin with a video on it. How? they do not have videotaped interrogations is how they're getting away with all this. So One way, I believe. Yeah. And the other way is prosecutorial misconduct. I was the only not wrongly convicted person who went up with, it could happen to you, uh, as a representative of Suffolk County for uh, district attorney abuse, um, for covering up for the criminals, not going after innocent people, and sat there at the table and said to them, you know, if you don't hold someone accountable for intentionally either not prosecuting someone or falsely prosecuting someone or putting false evidence, and I actually have done two documentaries on last year, Frank is in the documentary, Doreen came with me, and it was chosen to play on Capitol Hill, be, uh, which is crazy. My level of frustration is, you know, how could you put someone who is stressed, post-traumatic stress syndrome, an addict, 
you know, in a room and threaten them and then have no accountability for what you have done to them. You know, so that, that's a huge, it's a no-brainer. Look at this camera right here. How could that not be in every single interrogation? You know, you, you mentioned it, it can happen to you, which, you know, I'm, I'm part of that uh, coalition, my foundation um, is as well. And I just wanted to share in terms of New York and legislation and false confessions that, you know, one of the issues that we're going to be working on, um, you know, this year and however long it takes, because there is a reluctance in general at passing reforms, is uh, videotaping interrogation. So yeah. a few years ago, we did get that in New York. Um, but what happened is, um, they carved out exceptions that make no sense. So while it's mandatory for the police to uh, record interrogations as a general matter, uh, when it, it's not mandatory for second degree murder, it's not mandatory in drug cases, it's not mandatory in sex offense cases. So that's an issue that- um, So we're, for we're shoplifting? Working, I mean, come on, so it's we're, like- we're working on to try to close up those loopholes. Uh, another aspect of the problem that we haven't discussed yet, but I wanna just quickly mention something on is uh, the judiciary does not escape blame here. So when you look at, go to the website on the National Registry of Exoneration or the Innocence Project website where they have like the short case summaries of what happened and you look at how many red flags there were along the way prior to the DNA or other exoneration that happened and yet uh, you know, all the appeals are typically uh, exhausted. Uh, the average length of wrongful conviction is um, 14 years. What? So I think that That's average. part of the problem, and I experienced this as a defendant as well, you know, as I lost seven uh, uh, appeals, you know, is uh, if you have the law and the facts on your side, the laws and the case law, that's only half the battle. The other problem is, you know, are the judges going to have this knee jerk reaction to just affirm a conviction? Right? Or are they going to objectively consider the case? And I think that too often uh, they, they, they do not. So I do think that you know, awareness of wrongful conviction and training is part of it. Um, yeah. Now, I just want to mention one thing, just you know, um, we all agree like on the bulk of things. I just want to say in terms of the Central Park Five case and the prosecutor, I mean, while she may have noticed some discrepancies, she, she took no steps. At the end of the day, she took no steps to exonerate them. And, and you know they did, they all did the amount of time that they that that, that they did. So I, I just want to offer that that point of view. Mm -hmm. Let's do last question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We gotta go. You're too fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jack, you said you saved seven people from prison. There were seven people who are what, exactly. What does it person? cost to save a person? You know, it's it's hard to quantify. I know some organizations have done that, but when you're running a nonprofit. I mean, the, the difficulty in, in quantifying that is you, know, you, you have attorneys and paralegals and investigators on staff, so they're salaried. So how do you actually break out? It's not like you hired someone individually for a particular case, so it, it's, it's hard for me to like, quantify that like that, to, sit, to say you know, how much it is with one case. I mean, uh, aside from that aspect to it, I mean, how many witnesses are there? Where are they located at? Are you gonna, is the district attorney gonna agree with you? When you bring the evidence, are they going to litigate? Do you win the post-conviction motion? Do you lose and have to work your way all the way up through the prison, through the court system? So it, it's hard to really say that. I think that to have a well-run uh, nonprofit, you know, you would need to have at least two attorneys on staff. You would need like three paralegals, three investigators, uh, an executive director to oversee that the progress is happening. And that's just on the legal side of that. So right there, mm -hmm. what I articulated, dollars. we're between four and five hundred thousand dollars, and that's with professionals working at a nonprofit level, rather than you know what they would get in the for-profit sector. I can mention my son's case, John Juca, fifteen years in prison, wrongfully convicted. So far, we went through one point two million. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, well, John Juca is a well-known wrongful conviction case, uh, in, in which it was overturned on prosecutorial misconduct grounds. It was a unanimous decision by the uh, appellate court. The Brooklyn District Attorney, not wanting to let it go, mm -hmm. uh, appealed the reversal to the Court of Appeals, mm -hmm. which, by the way, if that was John appealing a decision he lost, he would have never gotten permission to appeal to them. Uh, but they gave the prosecution uh, permission to appeal, and then they reinstated the conviction. The vote was 6-1, and the thing is this, the. Judges who voted to reinstate his conviction, 
they didn't disagree that there was misconduct. They agreed, you heard me, right? They agreed that there was misconduct. Their rationale, uh, it was a harmless error. He would have been convicted anyway. Clear cut case of, uh, of, of, of it's a wrongful conviction case of manifest uh, injustice. And, and, and there's a new post conviction motion pending right now in which the actual perpetrator admitted he was the one who committed the crime, that John did not have anything to do with it. But yet we still got the Brooklyn DA's office fighting that case. I can tell you, it's overwhelming. For anybody who is in this line of work, anybody who's passionate and cares about these sorts of things, um, it's mentally draining. It's emotionally draining. Um, you know, I'll probably go home and fall asleep tonight reading transcripts, you know, of, of another case that came and trying to say, okay, what do we make of this one? Um, and, and, and so all, all we can do is educate people more and, and more. And yeah, that's what, what I just want to ask is, uh, what's, when we leave here, yeah. what's the next thing? I, I, I such I, I people ask me that I have no idea. <laughs> Other than I do, you know, I think, I, well, I think I, I think meeting with your elected yeah. officials, okay, to urge them to pass bills that are aimed at at preventing wrongful convictions. Certainly, that's true in terms of the issues that we're talking about here tonight. So the unfortunate reality is, is that most politicians are not going to do the right thing because well, it's the right thing to do. But if you can link that because you vote, because other people do, when, as a society, when we collectively demand that there be criminal justice reform, that's when we're going to <coughs> get more. And I think that's the key, collectively. Because collectively, yeah. Collectively, the era of going in alone is not. There's more power as a collective group. Well, I think it's that, but I also, that, but I also think you, sir, are a hero. Because we need more people like you. That's the only way to get out. No, you are. I appreciate yeah. that. You but truly I, are. I, I feel like it, it's something that I, I can't It's in your heart, it. right. It, but it, I don't think anybody anybody no, saw what I saw would. No, people can look away from it. But but it I wanna, I wanna it's, it's about education and it's about narrative yeah. storytelling, I think, because w when you hear people's stories and you feel their hearts and you feel <laughs> the, the impact on their lives, it'll cause you to go home and talk to your community about it and your neighbors about it. And hopefully they'll talk to people about it. I want to share a 